get right into it. One of the main reasons that you warm up and cool down is because no matter what your sport is, you play to win, right? You don't play, to, you know, maybe you play just for the practice of it, but most of the time when you're competitive, you really do play to win. And like it says, the little things do add up, especially over a long enough timeline. This can determine the difference between success and um, failure is what you're doing over a little of a long timeline. Cause you don't know what your opponent's gonna be doing. And if you're not, I wouldn't say working harder, but if you're not working smarter and all other factors are the same, they're gonna have the advantage on you. So let's talk about that. And that's the first reason why you do this. And then second reason you do warm up and cool down is because it reduces your chance of injury. It's very simple. You know, you could be playing on the field like soccer or anything else. You take that wrong step, you go down, you've seen it in sports, I'm sure, where the guy's like running and then all of a sudden either he just steps wrong and he has like a sprained ankle or something, or he gets hit, impact, his body's going one way, his, the rest of his body is going the other way, and it causes an injury. At least when you're warmed up, it can also, even if you find yourself in that injury situation, it can reduce the severity of an injury, which could result in it taking a lot longer or a lot less time to recover, depending on how you've prepped your body before that. Third reason that you do warm up and cool down is because, honestly, it tells your nervous system it's time to work or to restore itself. Think of um, your nervous system like the central operating system to a computer, right? If you're not telling the central operating system what to do, it's not going to have the instructions and it might not do exactly what you need it to do. And your nervous system, I'm not going to get too heavy into science, but I am going to hit you with a few... Um, I would think they're more college level stuff, but they'll just get you guys ahead of things, right? So your nervous system, it has two parts. When it's divided, that's called the autonomous nervous system. And it's divided into the sympathetic, which is fight or flight. And then it goes into the parasympathetic, rest and digest. When you can properly get your body to get into these states, it's gonna help out with performance. And on the other hand, it can also help out with something like getting to sleep because I'm sure at least one of you has had a night or two, even maybe even this week where you just can't sleep no matter how hard you try, you know? And breathing commands the nervous system. So proper warm up and proper cool down, they basically help get your body ready, your nervous system ready for what's coming up next. And that's why with cool down and warm up, when we get into the science of it, you're gonna see how it specifically applies for sports, but it can also apply to many other aspects in your life. All right, so, and here's a little quick fact. Your breath, like I was saying before, it instructs the nervous system when it's time to work or when it's time to relax, right? And this is, you might have seen this, this goes back like, I'm, I'm gonna be quoting some like older Indian stuff, Ayurvedic medicine um, with a breathing technique, but they've been doing this for as long as humans been walking around the earth, breathing techniques. When our technology was low, we would use it to, um, to calm our bodies down and to excite our bodies. If anybody's ever heard of Tai Chi, Qigong, or Ayurvedic medicine, these tie in um, extensively into breath work, into controlling your own prana, your own energy, which your, your prana, your, your chi, it's what is moving your blood. It's what's creating the energy for you to, to do what you need to do. And it all starts with your breath right so there are different techniques for it and they come into different breathing types now i don't think we have all the time in the world to talk about every single breathing technique that is out there i just want to talk about one method of each that can help you out because when you're warming up and when you're cooling down if you get your breath to align it's going to really prepare your body for work so whether you're in a cool down stage or you're on the massage table getting massage therapy, or let's say you're just in bed, right? You wanna do deep breathing. Some people call it diaphragmatic breathing. You know, it's a full breath. And you, as you breathe in, your belly gets bigger. And now one technique that I like to do is a three, four, five technique, which it's three seconds in, four second hold, five second breathe out. And now you wanna be conscious also about your out breath because all the all, all the innervation, all the action that happens in breathing comes as you're breathing in. Breathing out is just the relaxing of those muscles unless you're forcing yourself to breathe out. So in the three, four, five technique, 
It's in, it's hold, and then, and for five seconds, you breathe out. Doing this, I'm not gonna do this with you guys because I, I will calm myself down by doing this, um, but it's something that you can practice and get better at, and it works. And there's other techniques if you're trying to go into a more resting state that you could use on top of this, but just for elongating your muscles, getting them to relax from activity, this is gonna be a good thing to match up with everything we're gonna talk about in the cool down aspect. Now, stimulating breathing, right? A lot in, in the West, I've noticed that not everybody in the West, they have techniques to relax themselves through breath, but they don't know exactly the stimulating breathing that I've learned in Qigong and you know in Tai Chi. And what it is, is that it helps put the body into flight or fight mode, which it's not all bad. You think, oh, there's an enemy there and oh my God, I, my heart rate went up and I have to run from, from this animal, right? In the most primitive sense. But no, it's, it's just, it gets the blood flowing and it gets you ready for work. So it's that you'll be, you'll be more like you're fighting when you're competing. So turning on this aspect is very important. The technique that I like to go with is the um, breath of fire technique. It's a great method and it comes back, it goes back, dates back to um, ancient India, right? And the original name for this is the Kapal Bhati method, which is um, like shining head or something like that. It translates into directly, but it's just think about it, like your head shining, you have like this chi, you're like, you know, in super saiyan mode for lack of better words, right? And it activates you, it gets you to that next level. Now, what the breath of fire technique is, is it doesn't have any emphasis on the in-breath. It's all on the out-breath, right? So it's... And there's more to it, but it's that forced breath out that you're forcing it out. And you can... I'm not going to get too much into it, but in Ayurvedic techniques, you do different shapes of your tongue and with your lips, and then that'll create more energy depending on what you need to do, whether you need to be focused or you need to use your extremities like your outer limbs for some action, and that, that'll help it out even more. But as you're either about to warm up or you know during the midst of that warm up, you wanna do some kind of stimulating breath. They're usually shallow, more superficial, while deep breathing is more diaphragmatic but it's also, you wanna get the oxygen delivered to the muscles to um, allow it to perform really well. Let's move to the next one, there we go. So let's get into the facts of it. Now that we know how to breathe, let's talk about how warm-up prevents injury. Does anybody have any guesses or wanna interject here? I think it's about like moving your blood, uh, get it flowing, and it's about like warming up your joints so it's, so it's less, it's more flexible to movements. And um, if more blood is flowing, that means your muscles at work. That's, yeah, that's, that, how, yeah. It's, that's heading in the right direction. One thing that I want to like, there's gonna be a few myths I dispel, but people like to think, oh, I gotta be properly stretched up. It's not really the stretch, cause you have to think about it. So stretching is how far you can take a joint through a range of motion till you get to that end range. That, that end you get that end feel and then it holds and then after a while it opens up a little bit more right and that's the stretch it's like um pulling a rubber band from both sides now when you're thinking about let's go into the next one when you're warming up it's going to prepare your body's elasticity for action and it increases your range of motion now elasticity is what you want to prepare for the warm-up as you see with the picture there or anything you know you're going for like a lunge with your sword while you're fencing um, you're, you're serving in tennis, it's the kinetic chain. The kinetic chain is muscles meeting. So it's like muscles meeting at a joint, right? When I, when I pitch, if I'm pitching, it's not just coming out through the muscles going from my forearm to my hand. If the pitch is done right, it's coming from the foot and the entire body's firing and the force production goes from that foot. And as the muscles contract up that kinetic chain, it builds more speed. So by the time it's released, the force that's generated from your foot exiting your hand puts the heat, puts that speed in the ball. But the only way you get that contraction 
is through the body's elastic response. So this is why if you go to, has anybody been to a, a live game and got there early before the game actually starts? All right, if nobody's been to a live game, whether it's basketball, it's baseball, what you're gonna see, and sure, you see guys like if it's basketball, if they're taking shots, pitchers are throwing, right? But when, when you look at it, you're gonna also see the trainers on the field with them. And the trainers are having them do drills and they're preparing their body for action. And what you wind up seeing too, and I'll get into this a little bit later, is like I said before, when it comes to individual competition, whoever's better prepared is gonna do well. But when it comes to a large team, like a baseball team, the, the team that has the right fundamentals in place is gonna be the one that wins. So when you're looking at this, you want your body to have that full elastic response so you can properly do whatever it is that you need to do in your sport. Let's go a little bit further now. All right, so you do wanna increase your heart rate, right? Muscles, they need oxygen rich blood to perform well. And these warm-ups will raise the heart rate. So what this picture is right here, it's, let's just say it's a bicep, right? On the far left, it's the bone, the little white parts, the tendon, and then it goes into the muscle and the muscle belly. Now, let's say with the bicep, anytime it contracts, all these muscles down to the top little fiber they contract together and they cause the contraction, causing the joint to close, causing whatever action it is that you desire to happen. Now, all these muscles, they take in oxygen and um, muscle fibers, excuse me. All these muscle fibers, they take in oxygen. There's this thing, uh, I don't know if anybody's heard of it. It's called the VO2 max, the volume of oxygen uptake. It's really Everyone has a VO2 max. They do like treadmill tests where you walk and they look at your heart rate and they can do math to kind of figure out how well your body processes it. But if you have a higher VO2 max, then as you, tr as you warm up or even as you compete, there's gonna be a greater oxygen delivery to the muscle and the muscle fibers itself. And then what that's gonna do is allow you to perform your sport better. So. Either way, you want an increased blood flow to warm up those muscles, but at the same time, you want to also make sure that they're properly oxygenated, right? So let's go to the next one. Oh, wrong way. Hold on. All right. So muscles, they're like saltwater taffy. And what does that mean? Does anybody know what saltwater taffy is like? You've been to Manhattan Beach or something? Oh, uh, it's like pretty chewy, right? Yeah, it's really chewy. But yeah. you ever get it? it? It's in these little wrappers like this. And if it's cold, it's just stiff as all heck, right? And our muscles are kind of like this. Inactive, they're stiff and rigid. You've been watching a movie. You, you were sleeping. You're sitting there reading a book or playing video games. You know, that's when the muscles get really, really stiff. And then as you get older, sometimes you see them and they get up and they're like, ah! and your, your father or something stands up like this. And then he has to do that to stretch himself, that's because uh, he got stiff and rigid. And as we get older, it matters even more. And then when you're warmed up, you're supple. And when you warm it up, it's just like that taffy. As you warm it up, then you can stretch it, you can mold it, you can do all these things. So this is gonna tie directly into the resistance for injury when you warm up, right? Because yeah, sure, it's a little bit of your constitution and how you're, how you're built, but that's only the starting, that's the ground level, that's the foundation of what you have to work with. And as you build up, your body can receive more benefit as it's warmed up and it's supple, supple because now it can move, now, now it can perform better. And this is why you increase the heart rate so the blood flow goes into the muscles, it increases your core temperature, making those muscles move um, much smoother, right? Because like I said, your core temperature does have to go up. And this is why, if you ever noticed when you're like performing the, whatever sport it is, or you're in a gym exercising, before you get started, the room could feel fine. And then you get into it, all of a sudden the room just feels like someone turned up the heat and you're pouring sweat, but that's good. You do need that. I mean, that means that your muscles are properly warmed up and there are different types of warmups. There's a sport specific warmup and then there's a general warmups, right? Sport-specific 
foremost. Let's go to the next one. So this prepares your body for action. This is like you go from high intensity to low, or from low intensity to high intensity. It's the same concept of the bullpen in baseball. If you ever notice, they'll put, they won't put a, a relief pitcher right into the field. He's there throwing balls at a slower speed just to get his arm ready to warm up because with enough of those throws, you could really damage your rotator cuff or something. So you want to do that in the gym. When you, you go into the gym and like, let's say, oh, I don't, oh, there's a bench. I got to get on that bench. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to miss it. I can't do the warm up in the open area. So then what do you do? Let's say it's just a bench press. You go down and let's say you can do uh, 200 pounds for 10 reps, right? And that's what your work load is. But then you do something like you just take the 290s and it's a 145 and you just kind of pump out a higher repetitions, but lower weight because that's basically what it does is muscle fiber recruitment. So, you know, when we, when we do something, whether it's like the chest press, let's just stick with that one. The muscle fibers, like you saw in the example, they have to get recruited to do the action. Now, depending how heavy it is, you don't need all the muscle fibers to fire, right? So maybe only 60% do the work, but as you train it, you get that up higher, right? But part of why you do the warm up is because when it's at a lower rate, especially if you're going slower, it allows, again, the nervous system to be like, hey guys, we're gonna be firing in just a few minutes and oh i know this routine he's about to go harder on us so then it you know whether it's you know any place along the the spinal column or in the brain it gets the muscles to recruit more and then you're more efficient so that way it reduces the chance of injury through proper preparation yeah you got your hand up yeah so um if you're lifting a lower weight does that mean less muscle fibers are firing uh, it can mean less muscle fibers are firing, um, but you have to look at it as a percentage of load. You know, if you're doing like usually healthy is about like 60% of what you what you would be doing. If you're doing something too low, like you're doing work at like 30%, of course, you're not going to have enough muscle fibers recruited, but it's more will get recruited as you bring up the weight, but it's the activation. And if you get going all out on that first one, you know, the body didn't have a chance to, you know recruit all the fibers and that's why you 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 want to do it lighter but within reason um there's there's articles out there that can go into further detail of what i'm explaining or at the end i can go a bit more into it but did that kind of get the question answered yeah thank you all right you're welcome so general warm-ups this is like non-specific activity it could be foam rolling but stimulating foam rolling because foam rolling is one of those things that you can do both for warm-up and cool down but how you use it is different, right? So in stimulating, this means light and brisk. And I have videos on the Elite Healers Sports Massage YouTube channel that I'll make sure you get all the contact information at the end that'll explain different foam rolling techniques for different areas and even break down the difference between the stimulating style and the sedating style. But the stimulating style, it's going to, you know, work the muscles, it does compression, but as instead of it being just like a solid compression, it kind of goes up and down the length of the muscle, which will help prepare it. If there's any knots there, it doesn't fully break it up, but it kind of like reduces it. So that way knots will restrict the muscle fibers from contracting. So it allows you to move better, right? Mobility drills. This is something where you might, it looks like ballistic stretching, but it's like mobility drills might be like, you reach down and reach up, reach down for like shoulder work, you know, or something like that. And you're just mobilizing the joint, putting it through the range of motion. Cause if you put it through the range of motion without demands, it'll perform better when there are demands. And then there's the traditional thing that I think has been done since before I was even born. It probably goes back into like the 1950s or so, but just later on the elliptical machine or the treadmill. And they're just, you know, kind of doing something to increase their heart rate. This is the, the most traditional and the least efficient style of warming yourself up. So, I mean, I would look at it like foam rolling and mobility drills if I had to just do some kind of non-specific activity before I got into it. Now, stretching, this is one of those myths I want to dispel, right? Because stretching before activity, it actually increases your chance of injury. I mean, I know when I was younger, and I don't know if anybody else did, but like in this example, I'd be the kid making the rubber band gun and like shooting at my friends in like first and second grade, right? Um, and one thing, when you look at the rubber bands, right? You just want it 
just tight enough so you can get it off and shoot it, right? But you don't oh, stretch it and stretch it because then guess what? You stretch it too much and it's it'll probably just dribble off your hand and hit your toes rather than the person you were aiming at. You know, I'm not, I'm not recommending you do rubber band guns, but it's a great example just to help you get to understand it, right? Now, elongating the muscles, it's going to sedate the muscles. And the reason, and I go back to it again, is that when you elongate the muscle, it's not going to fire as efficiently, right? Just like that rubber band. You don't want it stretched out. You want the elasticity um, to be active. And then after you're done contracting that muscle aggressively, then you stretch it to get it to return to the normal resting length. Make sense? All right. So this is part of the key right here. Over time, and this is not just exercise, this is like your study habits or anything else. We become the result of our daily habits. So, you know, if you're doing something that you know is not good for you, you better like stop it soon. And the things that you're doing, right, just increase it, right? Because what we do creates who we are. And I'm not trying to get philosophical, but again, you guys are future athletes. I mean, to me, you're, you're current athletes. I think you guys should be called future professional athletes. Um, <laughs> Cause you know, just being in high school doesn't mean you're not an athlete, you're athletes in my eyes. So tactically training and preparing gives you the edge um, to win and stay healthy. You know, it's not like something, again, I was, I, I was a kid of the 1980s. So like I was the first a kid that had video games, right? And there is no respawn if you hurt yourself. Just simple as that, you know, you, you, if you get hurt, it's gonna be longer than a respawn time. It could be six months, it could be a year, it could be a year and a half. So you want to make sure that you do not get injured. And if you're on that track, it's really going to get you into a healthier place and the quality, your quality of life goes up. There we go, so now, I was going to do it for California, but I really don't know the California teams as much as well. So the example is the example of Tale of Two Teams. You know, when I was your age, oh, when I was your age, um, the Yankees were big in like the late 90s, right? They were, they were winning championships. I go to games. I lived, in, I lived closer to the Mets than I did the, the Yankees. So I saw a lot of Mets games, but I also saw Yankees games. And now one thing I did notice, and as I gained my education and I kind of put it all together, I realized that even on the professional level, the teams do things that are extremely different. And this is why a, a trainer, like a master trainer is just as valuable as any player on the team, because they're going to set the tone for that team. The Yankees would always have, the, aside from the budget, which was ridiculous, but they would have, because they had that huge budget, they would have the best coaches, the best trainers. And I would watch the warmups because it was just my family get there early and make sure that you don't have to go through the crowds. And I'd see the warmups. I'd see them go through everything. And the Yankees would do a lot of sports specific type of training, you know, and, and they'd be really going in there practicing that they get there earlier. They'd start uh, earlier and have their bodies fully ready to go. While the Mets, it was more general warmups. You saw the stars, a few of them warming up. And what did that spell? That spelled the difference between a team that can make the playoffs and get the championship almost every other year to a team that, you know, they were happy to get 500, you know, and to break 500. So it's really from the time it's even before high school to like the professional level, if all factors are the same, the way that you prepare yourself, it'll not only reduce your injury chances, but it's also going to put you on the track to win. And you know what? I'm pretty sure if you're competitive, you, you, you don't go, to, go there just to play. You play to win. Am I right? And that's why you want to take these things and really hold them true in your heart. Also, it's you guys are young. You know, I just two days ago became 41. And I have to say, it even starts in your 20s. If you're doing all this, because I started off in my teens too, if you're doing all this, you're going to age better than your friends. If people the same exact age as you, they're not taking care of themselves. They're not doing those little things. So it's not only on the field, it's off the field that you do all these little things. And it applies. Being an athlete, I believe, has made such a difference in my life and taking it seriously that I just watched myself excel over time. So 
the, the lessons, the discipline that you have to put into athletics, even on the warm up and cool down is going to help you. It's going to pour into other parts of your life and that's going to help out the quality there. And if you could take something on the field and use it to make your life better, go for it. Now, cool downs, the benefits and why we need it. All right. So one second. Cooling down, it's the first step in recovering from your training sessions or competition or anything just like that. And if you recover quicker, right, then you're gonna be ready faster than a competition. Now, this is something for nearly 10 years, I was working over at uh, Equinox. And one thing that it was very um, demanding was get me better than this person. I wanna perform better than this. And so that, was always a thing so it became and it wasn't just like the people training it was the trainers we would compete with each other we had the trainer games right and then it was all about your tactics you know it, it was if you were great on the field then it was your recovery from your last performance is so important because it gets you ready for your next performance that much faster and uh, recovery starts the moment that buzzer ends and the game's over right so you have different types of cool downs. You have the lower intensity activity, which is kind of like the way you introduced yourself to the workout by going from light to heavy. It's gonna be kind of just stepping it down in a similar fashion. And I'll get more into that in the next few slides. Then there's foam rolling. There's a sedating techniques that are a lot of holds, you know, relaxing on the foam roller, and then there's stretching. So low intensity activity, it's only done for five to 10 minutes post-competition or training. And one of the reasons you want to do this, especially like I've seen it not with people as young as you, but like college level and up is that stopping suddenly, especially if it's someone that hasn't been active and then they go into activity, like let's say it's January and they just did a new year's resolution or something stopping suddenly it can cause what's known as exercise associated collapse or EAC. Right. And what the reason that this happens is because the blood is in your, actually, I think it's on the next slide. Yeah, so it, um, it basically blood flows to your arms and your legs, your extremities to do performance. And then if you just suddenly stop, not returning blood to the heart, especially if you don't have a good VO2 uh, max and like your VO2 levels are low, so your body's not good at delivering oxygen to the muscles, your brain is going to be deprived of oxygen. And I've never seen anybody die from this, but they faint. And if you're, someone doesn't catch you when you faint, uh, you could probably cause some head damage and head damage could kill you. So it is, there is a possibility and it's simple. Like something that I'll do as like, let's say I'm in the gym more often than I'm playing these days. Uh, so, you know, I'll be done and I'll just, I look like a goof, but I'll do something like this. Or like, you know, and I'm just walking to the, to the locker room. You know, I'm just doing simple over exaggerated motions that are slow, you know, and you can make it look cool if you want, you know, figure out some cool way of moving that, you know, like makes people laugh if, you, if you're funny like that. But what you're trying to do is just get the blood to continue to flow to your thoracic area, like your chest, your ribs. So then it can be distributed back out to where it needs to, because when you're in rest and digest mode, your um, blood is mostly in your center. You know, it's hanging out in the middle, it's in the brain, but when you're performing, it goes to the extremities. That's also part of why you warm up to redirect the blood flow so you can move better. But you do not want to have exercise associated collapse because of that. Also, one other thing too, if you ever like, the, the elevation in some parts of California is low, other parts are high. Um, Denver, it's really high, right? They're like, they're like a mountain level city. So one thing that comes with that is if you're used to training in low ground, right? You, you're, you're running by the beach in California. It's beautiful. You do all your training there. You know, I've been to Long Beach. It's, you guys have the best beaches in the country, if you ask me. But then you go off to some place like you have an away game. You know, you made the pros or you're like D1 and you're traveling around. You go to a place that, where it's like Colorado, where the oxygen is low, what works for you in California or any other sea level city may not work for you in an elevated place like Colorado. So that's just something, especially if you're on the road or something, you want to avoid that. 
you know, you want to make sure that you're doing that proper cool down because you don't want to be the guy that's fainted. I've only in my entire lifetime, I've only fainted twice. Once the doctor was doing something on my foot. And next thing I know, there's like 10 doctors over me when I come back to. And then the other one was in, in the house and like I happened to hit the wall and just slide down very comical. But the thing was that I didn't hit my head. And if you do, the most important thing is not to get your head hit if this does happen to you, you know? But that's why make sure you just move the limbs, get it back, get the blood back to your uh, thoracic area. It's so important. So now let's talk about foam rolling for cooling down, right? Because these are different manners of preparing the body. Cooling down is slow, it's targeted. This is where you might see someone, if you go to the gym or something, you see them like laying down on the foam roller and it looks like they're cuddling a foam roller for like 15 minutes. That's more of that cool down activity, right? Um, foam roller, speaking as a sports massage therapist, it's like a good replacement for like on-field activity from a sports massage, but it's not the same because it does address similar things like your knots, your stiffness, and you need both massage or foam rolling and stretching to properly restore the muscles. Cause it's like you compress and you stretch and we'll have more examples coming up, right? And the reason you do that is these, uh, this picture here, these are examples of knots in the muscle fiber, right? So the more scientific term, they're called adhesions, but they literally look like knots. Remember when I showed you the fibers and they're all like bundled up together? Literally those fibers from the contractions between that and the fascia that um, it surrounds them, it'll get like stuck and then it won't release. And this can be released like with sports massage, the massage therapist gets in there, they, they compress, they do a little friction, they smooth it out, it goes away, right? Sometimes you might see, has anybody seen the athletes like, you know, uh, in the Olympics or something where they have the big circles on their back, the cupping marks? Yeah, cupping also, like the way the massage therapist will compress or cause friction to break up the knots, when it's cupping, it pulls and separates through that suction motion. All of these things will remove knots and you want to remove knots. Part of, and I haven't had anything that really proved it, but at the same time, I see it through more like empirical evidence, but when, and, and, and that's just, sorry, I, I should explain that, but that also empirical evidence is just observation, but not in a clinical lab setting. But one thing I have noticed is that as people get older, because again, like I said earlier, the art of aging, being at my age, I notice people my age, you're like, oh, 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 this hurts. And it's because I'm getting old. And I'm like, I'll say something like, dude, I'm a year older than you. I'm two years older than you. I'm not suffering like that. And part of it is, is if you don't take care of these knots, like, sure, we all feel great as teenagers, you know, but as time goes on, like I said, you become the result of your habits. So you want to age right. So you can be dominant in 35, 40, you know, and still, you don't want to peak at 25. You want to peak at 35, 40, or 45, you know? Um, and part of that is, is that you want to have the, if you don't address those knots and you leave them there, they start to build up. And then over time, this is, this is where you hear people say, oh yeah, it's, I'm getting old. It's like, no, you're not getting old. You don't take care of yourself until it's an emergency and you see the doctor, not for maintenance, but to fix things that are broken. So you will not only perform better when you're doing regular foam rolling and like a foam roller, it's like maybe 20, 25 bucks at the most, you know, there's fancier ones that vibrate and other stuff that'll really um, be expensive, but foam roll is a good start to just properly taking care of your body. And on my YouTube channel, I've made sure to provide lessons on how to foam roll properly because that's something I haven't seen there. So, you know, it's cheap and affordable. And that's why I did it too. Cause if you want to, if you want to get better at this, please take up all the, take up all the free content I give you as well. And you know, that's going to help your muscle fibers perform. And so now we go into stretching because like I had said before, and I'm just going to repeat it over and over because it's that important. Stretching is only done at the end of activity, right? Muscles, they create movement by contracting and that's on one side of the joint. So if I bend my elbow, 
then we have the biceps, and then we have some muscles in the forearm that they cross over the joint, they end on the opposite side of the joint, and then when they contract, they bring each other together, right? And meanwhile, the muscles on the opposite side, the tricep and the forearm extensor muscles, they're going to stretch during this part, right? So to, to um, recover through stretching, you need to stretch in the opposite way from whatever it is you were doing for proper recovery. You want to stretch specifically because then it allows you to recover specifically. I, I sometimes I, I, I work my hardest to get people to realize this, but sometimes they just want to do general stretching and then they wonder why their bodies hurt, right? Because they stretch, they stretch something they love to stretch all the time, but it's so loose, it's unstable. And then the thing that's getting tight is just tightening, tightening, tightening. And then one joint's too loose and the other's too stiff, that's gonna cause injury, right? So you want to get the, the whole point of a stretch. Sure, if you're a gymnast or something, you wanna increase your range of motion, but for normal people who don't want to, you know, like do the full 180 split with your legs or whatever, it's not about getting to some ridiculous level of, you know, stretchiness. It, because also if you're too stretchy, then you sacrifice your strength and power for the ability to stretch. So what you want to do is restore your muscles to their proper resting length. So they're ready to perform again. Also, if you don't know any questions on stretching the I've made, I have all the videos. Um, there's longer episodes that go like 10, 15 minutes that go through every muscle in an area like the arm the torso or then there's specific stuff uh so you, you could learn it for free all right so now with tips on stretching like i i might have already said some of this again but this is all because it's in here so you want to target those muscles that you use that's like number one and most important right stretching while your heart rate is coming down is better than stretching when your heart rate is totally on the base level because the blood's flowing. And remember that saltwater taffy that I talked about. The muscles are more supple. They're more able to be manipulated and changed. So this is why you wanna do it. You know, you want that core, it's basically when your core body temperature is up, it's not like can you perform better, but if you're cooling down, you're gonna get a better stretch response out of your muscles. And again, it does go back to breathing deeply. Uh, your breath tells your nervous system what to do. The nervous system is the command center for your entire body. Now, one myth to bust about stretching. Yoga. Yoga does not provide a stretch that will allow you to proper recovery. Perfect example is this downward dog that's on the picture, right? Now, downward dog, it'll, it, in, in that particular picture, right? You're gonna, the, the upper trapezius muscle, the deltoid muscle, they're all getting activated, right? And you get the upper pec fibers, pec minors also gonna be active all in this area. Now, these muscles, when it comes to different sports, right? Baseball, even like a bench press, you know, fencing, tennis, all those muscles are already working. And if, when you're in this position, with the downward dog position, you're getting a lower back and gluteal stretch more than anything else. Those muscles like the deltoid and all that, they are still contracting. So while it might, it, it, you might think it feels good, you're going to hurt yourself. There's um, two types of people that come into elite healer sports massage more than anything. And it's for different reasons, but uh, the, the core underlying thing is they don't practice the proper fundamentals. And that is yogis, and then people who practice CrossFit. Now, I don't have any problem with either one. I mean, I'm having to fix them up and fixing them up is what I do, but I don't want people to get hurt. You know, people are getting hurt all the time because they don't realize something like yoga, it's closer to martial arts, it's closer to Qi Gong, it's closer to Tai Chi, or even endurance training than it is stretching. It's not focused on the specific things. And one of the things as like, Americans, I think that we misunderstood about yoga when we brought it into the popular culture is it's one part of a greater way of healing. It's part of Ayurvedic medicine. And one of the things that the yogis had used back in the day yoga for, aside from like the physical health benefits, 
was to balance their chakras, their energy centers, right? And it's similar to Qigong in this sense, where the different movements activate different energy centers of your body, or in um, more of a Qigong sense, it activates different elements of Qi in you, you know? And it's more meant to balance the body to the spirit. As, the, as it was brought from the East to the West, that aspect was lost. There's still a little, I, I know in New York, there's a bit of a resurgence in that, but we're still kind of learning that, but you don't want to do that, you know, like yoga or something for your recovery. You want to focus more on those specific things. And, you know, you'll have the, and one of the reasons I think that both, and I'm, I'm not going to apologize for this, but both uh, yogis and CrossFit people hurt themselves is they are a bit more cultish than any other group of people that exercise. They have a large group mentality of how, how to do things. And the, the standards for the trainers are usually, well, the, the instructors are usually lower and don't have as much anatomy and science behind it. So that's why some of these things wound up leading to more injury, right? Stretching versus foam rolling. There's no verses in this one. They really are there to complement one another. You see this picture of the rope, right? That knot in that rope works the same way as a knot in your muscles. So stretching would be pulling the rope at two different sides, right? What does that do to the knot in the rope? It leaves it there. It makes it tighter. And that same thing happens if we're just stretching, we're just stretching, you know, those knots are not addressed. And I'm pretty sure, uh, uh, maybe there's one or two of you that have gotten a massage. I didn't get a professional massage in my teens, so I wouldn't expect that of you guys either. But one thing is, as the massage therapist is working on you, they'll stop in certain areas and those areas will feel very painful. Those are the knots and you have to get rid of the knots and then you can stretch even better. So when you're looking at not foam rolling versus stretching, do your foam rolling first and then get your stretching going on second. Take the knots out of the, out of the muscle, out of, take the knots out of the rope before you try to elongate it and make it longer. It makes sense, right? It's all about getting it to that um, resting length. And now what else can we do to um, prevent injury, right? And to allow us to recover better, to get into the next game sooner. Get a sports massage, that's number one, right? Especially if it's like a big competition and it matters a lot, getting that sports massage and that massage therapist that knows your sport will allow you to optimally recover. Now, eating healthy, non-processed foods. You guys live in like the best place for fast food in the entire country. You know, you guys have In-Out Burger, you have all these different things, but those things, while they might taste good, they're not the proper fuel. You know, it's like if we could put multiple things into a car and different types of fuels would get different results, that's kind of like how our bodies work. So when you want to compete, when you want to have the edge and reduce your chances to, in, to injure yourself, you got to eat those nutrient-dense foods. You got to eat those things that like the cavemen would eat. You know, if we eat closer to like a caveman and non-processed foods, I'm all about that paleo diet for optimal health. But as long as you're not eating processed foods, you're going to have better energy levels. You know, it's also stay away from things that like, let's say medications. If like you need it, you need it. And that, that's the fact. But if it's just something that you want to take in the pill form because it makes you feel good or whatever, you know, that's also going to be detrimental to your health in your sports performance and then things have side effects so you have to also just be use your use your discernment oh you know when the doctor says you have to you have to but when it's like supplements or it's any little thing like that you got to be careful with that you know and then the most 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 important thing is to sleep well our body while we're sleeping it does a lot of repair to the body so over time you, your body just functions better off of more sleep. And sometimes you might be like, hey, Adam, I have trouble sleeping. One thing is sometimes because, you know, we, we descended from cavemen, cavemen, they had to do everything. There was no iPhone. There was no fast food delivery. You know, heck, they couldn't even go to the store. They had to hunt everything. So sometimes when you can't sleep well, you're not doing enough physical stuff with your body all day. You know, you're not properly expending your energy. 
And that's why you'll, you'll be more awake at the end of your day because the body thinks there's still more. So sometimes just making sure you knock yourself out will help. And then you can get those eight hours a day, you know? Now we'll go into the questions part, but make sure that, you know, if you want more info on warmths and cool downs, just check out the channel, Elite Healers Sports Massage. I've also started a, um, talking about how celebrities get fit because I've noticed that it's very relatable. If like the person writing the story um, behind the celebrity is true, not everyone tells you the truth. Cause if you see it's like they're doing three by 10 workouts in the gym, then that person just giving you garbage and didn't do the research. But like someone like Tom Hardy's overcome certain problems to get fit. Chris, Chris Pratt likes to go from fit to fat and back to fit again. So these are different processes, but they all become fit. They all are in great shape at a certain point or another. And I think these stories are relatable because you can see yourself in them. And then that, the way I teach that, it's fun, it's enjoyable, but you can easily apply the stuff so that way you can perform better, you know? Cause that's, that's it. Like I, I'm glad you guys gave me the opportunity to speak because it's, I want more younger people to be doing the right thing with their bodies. Cause if you do that, you win competitions, but it's the art of living well. It just helps you live better of a life, right? And then let's go to the next one. Boom. So. If you do want to follow me, you feel free to follow me. These are the different things that you can follow me on Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn, Odyssey, and YouTube. And sometimes if you can't find a video on YouTube, go to odyssey.com because even one of our videos on how to foam roll your glutes, because I put glute release got taken down on YouTube, but it's still up on Odyssey. So you can find everything there as well. Boom. And now that concludes my part. What are your questions for me? Oh, I have a question. So mm -hmm. in regards to the last time you talked about, like maybe sleeping not enough can damage you, right? What about sleeping too much? Maybe like not every day, but what if once in a while, say instead of eight hours, you sleep like 10 to 11 to make up for lost sleep? Is that a well, bad thing? or No, it's, it's not a bad thing, but and I can't remember all the facts off the top of my head, but there is no catching up with sleep. You know what you lose and you might feel better but uh they they the scientific studies that they've done have shown that the body does not technically catch up but heck man everybody needs a recovery day i should have put that in and thank you for bringing up that question because when you're looking at it right 16 15 17 you feel like you keep going 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 sometimes you have way too much energy or maybe i'm just speaking for myself but when when it when it comes Hold on one second, I'm just gonna get some water. But when it comes to that, you need a rest day. And when you, when you have a rest day once a week, it allows your body to make all the adaptations it needs. If you don't allow your body to rest, then it leads you to a higher chance of injury. You start to, over a few weeks, you'll feel like you're wearing yourself out. It's, um, so rest is important. Never feel bad about having that day off. If you're really competitive, I would only have one to two days off at the max. But then again, life happens. And sometimes, you know, whether it's the demand your teachers or the demand of your parents or a different factor, you know, it's gonna, it might throw you off and you do need to recover. No matter how you perform, you know, you should always, the biggest concern is always doing what's right for yourself. So, you know, if you need the extra rest, Take the extra rest. Okay. All right. Thank you. That helps a lot. You're welcome. Any other questions, guys? Uh, so let's say I'm like a basketball player and uh, I have like workouts like pretty much every day. And like when I wake up the next day, I'm still kind of sore. So are you saying like you shouldn't stretch before like your next workout? If you're like within the hour before, then no. If it's like you wake up, and, you know, like, let's say you wake up 7 a.m. and your game is at noon. You want to stretch out a little bit, stretch out a little bit, you know, because you are stiff um, from the lack of movement that goes on, you know. But I wouldn't in the, like, two hours before, I would stay away from doing that. You focus on – there's plenty of other things you do to get yourself to warm up, and I would just focus on those things because no matter 
what the sport is, you know, that's going to happen. And one other thing too, when you wake up and like, you feel, you feel that soreness, this is where a sports massage and eating more protein come into play. So whether it's, if you're vegan, then it's going to be a lot more kale and broccoli. If you're not, then the, it's a lot out there that's open for you, but you should increase and I'm not a nutritionist, so I don't remember all the factors onto how high it has to be. Because there's a fa- there's a formula for grams of protein against how much you weigh. You can look that up and find it, but it's about making sure your body has a proper amount of protein to restore the muscles. Because part of when you're waking up sore is the body still in repair mode from the last performance, and the more protein you give it, the better it can rebuild the muscles. And then, like I said, um, sports massage kind of realigns the fibers, get stuff like properly uh, moving and yeah, your recovery is important. But yeah, stretch in the early part of the day, but not, not too close before. So, so do you like massage guns do the same, same thing? Uh, massage guns? Yes and no. Like, here's the thing. So when it comes, excuse me, when it comes to a um, massage and um, massage guns and foam rollers, like if you took the whole massage, the, um, the, uh, Oh, wait, should I just take this off of the any questions? Yeah, right. Um, but yeah, when, you, when you're using a massage gun, it's not exactly like, let me just do this real quick and then I'll answer that. Stop share, good. Okay, so when you're looking at like a massage gun or you're looking at um, a foam roller, there's five fundamental strokes in massage and then there's variants of those strokes, right? Now, one of them is vibration, which the massage gun does vibration. And then there's also the potent, which is like the pounding, which is what a massage gun does. Compression is another one of the strokes, which is more of what a foam roller does, right? So they are aspects of the whole complete thing that you would get from a sports massage, but they still are beneficial. I have also because I, I noticed that there wasn't any education on it. I'm getting through teaching the entire body still um, on the channel. So I, I can teach you that and help you out with that a little bit more. But yeah, a massage guns are good. And if you have trouble even like finding them, you know, there's a whole bunch that are really good out there. I've reviewed some of them and you can find great ones. Great, top of the line. Theragun is overpriced and it's like yesterday's news and Hypervolt too. Um, they're just big corporations still overcharging. The best ones I found are between $105 and about $150. You know, that give you more, better amplitude, more attachments, and even come with their own carrying cases. Those premier expensive ones don't even have their own carrying cases. So a massage, yeah, exactly. It is kind of ironically funny. But like a massage gun, it's not as good as a sports massage but it's still gonna give you a competitive edge when used properly. And also one other thing, just like a foam roller, it can be used for both warm up and cool down and follows almost the same exact rules as the foam roller. It has to be light and stimulating. So it'd be like, you know, just quick and brisk, like over the hand, over the arm, over the shoulder. And it's more stimulating and fine and you hold into like certain areas when you're cooling down. You can do like some like range of motion stuff as it's beating up on an area and help it out with a better cool down. So yeah, there are, it's good. It'll still give you an edge, but it's not like a sports massage. But even with people I work with, I'll tell them depending on their frequency, if they're super competitive, like they're a pro athlete, like I say, come in once a week, right? And, but if it, they're in semi-pro or less, two weeks, four weeks, maximum, I'd say six weeks between. But then that time in between, it's not that you're not doing anything and I'm just, I'm performing a miracle. No, it's not that. It's that it's a supplement that it keeps you at a better performance level until you can get that full repair work. You know, it's like, if you have a car, you could change the oil, but if it needs anything bigger, you take it to the mechanic to fix it up. It kind of works like that. Make sense? Yeah. All right, cool. Anybody else? Hi. Right, so, uh, I currently have a groin injury and what is your take on the uh some of the best best and fastest ways to treat a strain groin to say that last part the best what a strain groin a strain groin I would go to the doctor first 
um, then they'll probably give you a referral to PT. And I would mix it between like, this would be more like medical massage in that case when an athlete's in, in your level of injury, Chris. Um, but I would be following the advice of physical therapists and massage therapists and kind of, cause I don't know what stage of the injury or recovery you're in. So I'm not going to get too specific, but they usually, when you're in recovery stages have like step-by-step -step like guidance and advice. And I would follow that and just kind of make sure you're minimizing activity until you get into a healthier state. And then it's not about minimizing the activity, but being able to challenge yourself to work through it. Not aggressively, you know, doing the craziest things for your groin, but, you know, like making sure the muscles are utilized and active because if it's stiff for too long, then it's going to be harder to move it, but you want to make, protect it long enough so it can get to the proper stage of recovery. So then you can start to utilize it light and then eventually get back into the more competitive uh, side of things. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody? Yeah, I also got a question. So for the foam roller, you said you can use it for warm up, both warm up and cool down. So the difference will be just like when you're warming up, it's supposed to be light and just stimulating. And yeah. when you're cooling down, you're supposed to do it harder and well, or not harder, but lower. Um, you can hang out in places and yeah. in a sense, it's both both methods are aggressive, but this is like when it's cooling down, it's more like aggressive, like you find a knot and you and you're on it. And uh -huh. when you compress a knot, it's painful. Sometimes it's so painful. Like if I compress here, it's like I feel it there, but then it travels into my arm too. And I feel it in both places. Yeah. You know? okay. So you target the nuts while you were cooling down. Yeah. And you just kind of hang out on it. Or like something like, like let's say it was on my lap and like I have a knot on my lap. I can also then stretch away from it. Like, let's say the ground's there and the roller's like here. And like, I just kind of stretch away from it. And I just, what's called a pin and stretch technique, you know? Okay, got it. Thank you. Yeah. And then, like I said, like, I go into like a lot of detail, on like foam roller stuff. So you can get even more from uh, the videos. Ooh, we lost somebody. Yeah, I think Brian had to go, but he said, thank you very much. You're a very good speaker. I see that. Yeah. All right. But um, anyone else have any more questions? We can just. Oh, yeah, I have one last question. Yeah. Um, so my question is that. Uh, um, so I get like shin splints a lot. So are there any like warm ups or stretches that I can do to, that I can do to prevent them from the future? Well, shin splints. Um, depending on, you know, like whether it's more like a chronic or, you know, casual, it can, it can still keep coming back. Right. So one of the things is there's, um, you can get like a lacrosse ball or tennis ball, depending on your, um, level of sensitivity. And there's different techniques like for warm up and cool down, actually just hang on right here. I'll show you real quick. I happen to have a lacrosse ball just right over. So simple things avoid when you're doing first off when you're doing like foam rolling or anything do not put pressure on the bones right always avoid the bone because if you put too much pressure on the bone you can break the bone uh, muscles have more flexibility so one thing i'm going to avoid the shin bone i'll just put my hand over it and then with the other hand i kind of cup into it and then while i do that and you can keep your foot down i'm just making sure it's on camera you can do little circles or you can leave your foot grounded and just go up and down the length of the muscle, do it more stimulating for, um, for warm up, and again, hold and compress for cool down. And that's something you can do. Also, one of the other things that some people fail to realize is that the muscles in your shin, they connect right into the bottom of your foot, right under the ball of your foot. So you can take a lacrosse ball and then just barefooted, stand on it and just compress it. And if you compress it right in that um, ball of the foot that's under your big toe, you're gonna get right into that, uh, the tendon side of that muscle. And that can, getting it both where it attaches and in the belly can also help reduce the intensity of um, shin splints. Also just uh, so one other thing that can help is soaking your feet in Epsom salt. So warm Epsom salt bath, it's, um, 
there's a neuromuscular component to the Epsom salt that when it breaks down into warm water, it helps um, transfuse into your body and then allows the muscles to kind of restore. That's a little bit less of the science that I'm an expert at. I just understand the, the basics to the Epsom salt one, but it does help. I've seen it help a lot of people out with shin splints as well. All right, thank you. You're welcome.